Nintendo's Metroid franchise first kicked off on the NES not even 30 years ago, in fact, close to it. The same year as both Zelda and Kid Icarus, no less. This very franchise is synonymous with not only the sci-fi themes that it carries, but also fuses these two classics together in terms of the action platforming and the massive time-consuming exploration factors. To begin with, we're diving into the first Metroid for the NES. By now, this game and its foreboding intro should be nothing short of second nature and commonplace to us. And before I forget, this was produced by the late Gunpei Yokoi, who also helmed the production of the aforementioned Kid Icarus. Not to mention, he was well known for the creation of both the original Game Boy, and of course, the infamous Virtual Boy, the latter of which turned out to be a commercial failure. History aside, onto this game's main plot. You, as Samus Aran, are tasked, in the form of a Galaxy Federal Police briefing, with seeking out and exterminating not only the title lifeforms, which I'll discuss later, or better yet, their predecessors, hence the simpler mutants, which I'll also discuss momentarily, that are lurking throughout planet Zebus, or in this case, Zebeth, and its vast, diverse regions, but also their reigning ultimate organic being, the mechanical life vein Mother Brain. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where the complex beyond elaboration gameplay aspect comes in. Speaking of, it's another one of those non-linear action-adventure platformer hybrids, if way beyond that, where you're exploring one terrain after another, while wiping out various alien creatures ranging from crawlers, flyers, swarms, swoopers, hoppers, floaters, and the like, maneuvering through endless obstacles and obtaining various aiding items to reach every pivotal goal that lies ahead. Also, remember the backtracking feature I mentioned last time? Not only is it present here, the same capability applies to the sequels which will also be covered later. Therefore, you'll be doing a fuck-ton, and I do mean a fuck-ton of it. Your rudimentary controls consist of your D-pad moving Samus around, aiming her weapon horizontally, left and right that is, and upward, and none of that 8-way Contra shit, and even allowing her to traverse through narrow diminutive spaces via the Morph Ball, obtained at the very left of the starting point. Select swaps your current beam and missiles, more on those momentarily, and even the traditional B and A to fire your beam and missiles and land your bombs in Morph Ball mode, and jump, respectively. Onto the item and weapon rundown, well, aside from the introductory Morph Ball. You've got your energy refills, as well as missile refills, both of which you'll need every last bit of as you progress. Energy and missile tanks, the former of which further extend Samus's vitality every time you obtain them, whereas for the latter, it rounds out Samus's secondary ammo, which are way tougher than her normal beams, and both can be found in various terrains. And then you got your Morph Ball Bombs, also used for breaking down barriers and walls aside from wearing down enemies. So refer back to the controls, whenever applicable, in terms of Samus' beams, she's got a weak short-range type, which does damn near fuck all, but is able to eventually advance its capabilities upon earning a long beam, and then later a wave beam, and even an ice beam, for freezing enemies in place and using them as platforms, each with their individual sets of advantages and disadvantages. High jump boots for making Samus leap higher, obviously. Her trademark Varia, or Barrier, suit, which not only tickles Samus pink, no pun intended, it also reduces the damage that Samus withstands by approximately half. The blue ring in Zelda much? And finally, the iconic screw attack, not to be confused with the gaming community website, in which Samus can obliterate enemies and random projectiles via a more driving and intense spin jump with no strain. Your energy, and later missile count, is indicated in the form of two-digit and three-digit number systems, respectively. Each time you obtain an energy tank, a block is added to the top for an expanded lifespan, but upon reaching the quote-unquote low point, precisely less than 20 health, the infamous You're Fucked alarm is triggered, in the style of Zelda, and even the first Ninja Turtles game. Upon death, the traditional game over is declared, at which point you're provided with a 24-digit password, consisting of letters, uppercase and lowercase, sporting two typefaces, the former containing numbers 0 through 9, whereas the latter contains only two characters, a question mark and a hyphen, hence the continue option at the beginning. Again, Kid Icarus much? Stipulations aside, other than the aforementioned massive cast of mutated lifeforms, there's two main sub-bosses, space pirates if you will, they have to seek out and eradicate the shit out of in order to reach the final series of incidents. 
First off, you got Kraid, a humongous, if in this game's case, the same size as Samus, three-eyed reptilian scumfuck whose only means of assault are stomach and face daggers, and spiked boomerangs from the back, located deep under Brinstar, and later reappears as a fake clone, which acts in the same exact manner, and Ridley, named after the director of Alien and Blade Runner, obviously. A skeletal, pterosaur-like dragon sporting wave fireballs, located precisely within Lower Norfair, aka the second boss hideout. Defeat both of them, my suggested order being Ridley before Kraid, or vice versa, and 75 extra missiles, totaling 150, are added to your arsenal, and are later reincarnated in the form of stone statues used for guarding the final area, Torian. Pursuing them beforehand, however, is another story in and of itself. In fact, it's easier fucking said than done! And don't even get me started with the blue and red corridors, the latter of which requires five missiles to open. In some cases, enemies will randomly follow you, thus hindering the door from closing. Going back to the mini-boss pursuits and explorations, those are the usual next topic comes in. Same situation with the enemies and hazards. As decent and receptive as the controls are, like most Nintendo-produced games, they can take a while to get used to, if in full honesty not too damn long. Despite a few overwhelming setbacks and hindrances, specifically the obstacle maneuvering and precise shot aim and timing detection, it's still manageable. Same story with the gameplay schematics, notwithstanding their repetitive nature. Concerning Metroid's challenge, as I mentioned in my Clash of Demon Head review last time, most non-linear open-world action-adventure platformers like this one will absorb each and every second of your precious time, like Shang Tsung stealing his adversaries' souls upon their myriad of demises. Unless you're familiar with any and or all sections of Planet Zebus, the chances of getting pointlessly lost are approximately god knows how fucking many to one. Therefore, I suggest referring to and or designing a map, online, via your manual, what have you, and from observation, respectively. And while we're at it, avoiding every liability, or at the very least, attempting, in terms of enemy contact, environmental hazards, the works. And even farming and grinding your ass off for extra refills in even the most critical times of need can be unyielding beyond all means of logic, description, and imagination. Must I mention that the former gripe will do a hell of a lot more than hand your synthetic ass back to you in a metal grinder if you're slipping up and not on your toes? Also, be forewarned that you have to start over from either the beginning or the starting point of your current later location following your recent death. Speaking of, in the original Japanese Famicom Disk System version, you're allowed to save your own progress, but in both the American and European versions, yet again, you're stuck with piss all but the 24-digit password system a la Kid Icarus, as mentioned earlier. What the fuck, Nintendo? All technicality-based venting aside, compared to most of the other areas throughout Zebus, the aforestated final area, Torian, is a smidgen more of a mindfuck, considering how there isn't much ground to cover. Not only are there randomly appearing energy rings of death, which can also be frozen and used as platforms if you've still got your ice beam, this is where the tidal organisms come in. And take note, you'll be running into them a hell of a lot throughout and or towards the end of each outing. Those vile ass, relentless, life ingesting, gelatinous, jellyfish like Metroids. If any happen to get near you, they'll do just that. In which case, I suggest wiping those puny scum fucks out in advance. And this is where the iconic strategy comes in. Freeze them first with the ice beam, land five missiles on them, done. Oh, and don't expect your other beams to work, cause they're worth piss all. And if necessary, land a bomb or two near them, or find the nearest corridor to have them escape. Or better yet, farm for more energy and missile ammo should you find yourself in yet another critical state of urgency. Upon reaching the last corridor, we're acquainted with a shit ton of more energy rings, defense turrets, penetrable defense barriers, via your missiles of course. And finally, old Mother Brain herself, who turns out to be nothing more than a pessimistic as fuck pushover, despite the preceding slew of defenses she beckons, which will still catch off guard interminably, for lack of better words, all the Christ damn time. Anyways, should you manage to defeat her, that is, if you've still got enough missiles, a time bomb is thus triggered, at which point you're left with no other alternative but to haul ass for the damn teleport elevator, provided that your jumps are deliberately timed. And depending on not only the game's difficulty, but also the duration of your completion, you'll get one of five possible endings, which I fully intend to keep on the hush-hush, despite my innermost knowledge. Though the graphics haven't aged very well, somewhat, and I'm more than inclined to agree with everyone. In my case, however, I might just have to go on record stating otherwise. Now, despite lacking a background, except maybe in the title screen, I mean, it's the fucking NES for God's sake. All the central elements were rather distinctive and adaptable, presenting something of an ominous, uncanny, and foreboding atmosphere in terms of the diverse area of environments through which you explore, especially the introductory Brinstar and even Norfair. Same spiel with their supporting enemy appearances, though the simpler creatures at the beginning leave a hell of a lot to be desired. Not to mention the earlier stated Kraid, as opposed to his later appearances. Samus herself isn't too damn shabby, mostly in terms of said character's overall basic actions, that is. And speaking of which, heartfelt apologies for that spoiler right there. 
And while we're on that subject, although the game's manual indicates the character is a he, in reality, Samus is actually a dudette. A lady, a girl, you get the drift. Talk about mind blown. And as we're already aware by now, female characters in games were reduced to the usual damsel in distress roles. For example, Peach and Daisy, Sylvia from Kung Fu, Princess Yuki in The Legend of the Mystical Ninja, Daphne in Dragon's Lair, the infamous Princess Elise in Sonic 06. In fact, let's not even get ourselves started with that bitch. Pauline in Donkey Kong, obviously Zelda. I could go on all day. But in the case of this particular game and its subsequent follow-ups, it was a huge fucking deal having a lady take over the central hero role. Red Sonia, eat your heart out. Ellen Ripley, move the hell over. Therefore, more important roles were annexed to the ladies as the decades came and went. For example, SNK Playmore's Athena, Blaze Fielding from the Streets of Rage trilogy, Annette Meyer from El Viento and Ernest Evans by Wolf Team, Alice Landale and even Nay from the Fantasy Star franchise, Lara Croft from Tomb Raider, Marina Lightyear's and Mischief Makers, Parasite Eve's Aya Brea, what have you. Once again, I could go on all damn night. Music and sound-wise, composed by the legendary hero Kazuhip Tanaka of Kid Icarus, Urban Champion, Jaramite, and Stack Up, both the original arcade and NES versions of Donkey Kong and Mario Bros. fame. He was even a sound designer for both the second and third Donkey Kong games, later on known as Chip Tanaka. The overall soundtrack is nothing short of phenomenal and extraordinary, with some overtones of isolation and suspense thrown into the mix. And no matter how far you roam, every mood-setting, valiance, and ambient track will suck you in like a goddamn whirlpool, and will keep you guessing until the very end. Especially at supporting jingles, specifically Samus' appearance at the beginning of each trip when you either start and or continue, or the acquisition of every key item upon coming into direct contact with it, not to mention following the defeat of both Kraid and Ridley. The sound effects aren't too much of a drag either, though once again, they can drone over you after a given period of time. From what I've heard, the original Famicom Disk System version is more refined compared to what we Promised Land folk ended up with, thanks to its additional wavetable instruments. My top 5 favorites from this game alone are as follows. Prince Star, Crate's Hideout, Norfair, Silence, Her in a Few Random Rooms, and the Time Bomb Escape after defeating Mother Brain. In terms of replayability, taking into steadfast consideration what a revolutionary first foray this atmospheric sci-fi themed non-linear adventure turned out to be, sold at an approximate mind-blowing 2.73 million copies no less. Due to each and every key strategy and element that I've outlined thus far, in terms of the diverse paths you're able to explore, with countless adversaries that lurk about, and even the passwords that provide the player with additional benefits aside from continuing, which target space pirates to aim for first, how much resources are necessary for survival, the multiple endings, what have us. Metroid is definitely something you'll be returning to time and time and time again, but heed my advice well. Heed it like you've never heeded it before. Exhibit B, Metroid 2 Return of Samus, released for the Game Boy half a decade later. Just like its NES predecessor, this was also produced by the late Yokoi. Take it away, Riley Sky 100. Following the success of Metroid for the NES in 1987, Nintendo got to work on its direct sequel, Metroid 2 Return of Samus, and released on the Game Boy in 1991. Late 1991 to be precise, and later in Japan and Europe in early 92 and mid 92 respectively. Hiram's Metal Storm much? This picks up right where its predecessor left off, though in the official timeline after Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, except Samus is now tasked with seeking out and destroying an even tougher and diverse array of Metroid breeds on their home planet SR388, after various teams of G-Feds have dropped from radars. Basically, the premise is to kill waves and waves of hostile creatures just like before, but with some changes to the mix. No shit, man. And obvious changes they are indeed. Speaking of which, there's a counter on the bottom right of how many Metroids must be wiped out, which will be discussed eventually. The gameplay of Metroid 2 is pretty much the same thing as a previous game, except with some new features thrown in. Samus can now fire downwards with her traditional long beam and the ability to duck allowing her to eliminate ground enemies with ease. None of that weak ass short range beam horseshit like in the first game. And your Morph Ball ability is annexed right from the get go and you start off with 99 HP and 30 missiles to the arsenal, both of which can be replenished at any time. Especially at the game's starting and ending point, her trademark gunship. Speaking of which, there are refill stations for both resources found throughout each area, which are few and far between notwithstanding your tendency to grind and farm for them as you advance. Aside from obtaining the usual bombs and ice beam, not to mention the more improved wave beam, the various suit, high jump boots, and even the screw attack from the previous outing can be found throughout each terrain of SR388. New beams include the Spacer and Plasma Beam, both of which fire off a parallel triple kit union of small arrays, and a longer and more powerful, despite being slow, burst, respectively. 
In terms of aiding items and abilities, the spider ball, spring ball, and even the space jump are added to Samus's repertoire as they will allow you to explore the environment literally from top to bottom. They can allow her to stick to and traverse up or down walls and other structures after pushing down twice while in morph ball mode, jump while in said mode, and make more laborious leaps of faith in midair while maintaining its rhythm respectively. Benefits aside, as mentioned earlier, Samus must hunt down each and every single Metroid lurking throughout SR388 while dealing with the simpler creatures and eradicating any and every possible barrier in between. As for the new Metroids to discover, there are four new breeds that are the core focus of the game that mutate from their original form, if at times, first at the beginning and later at various intervals. Alpha, Gamma, Zeta, and Omega, all ranging from weak-ass pushovers to the reigning emperors of frustration, putting even the likes of every motherfucking robot master and maverick from every Mega Man game, Classic and X respectively, and even the likes of Jockeyo, Ashtar, and Clancy from Ninja Gaiden 1 through 3, to absolute shame. While the former two aren't much to write home about, despite the Gamma being a bit more challenging by comparison if you're not aware of its patterns, the latter two are even more unpredictable than all of Kitteridge and Game of Thrones combined, and can be more of a ravenous, relentless gang of cock-knocking jackasses in terms of the countless ammo that they require in order for their asses to be wiped out. The extreme latter, however, namely the aforestated Omegas, are something of a pushover, and can be killed faster if you aim and land some missiles towards their backside. Bottom line, each and every single Metroid, hence the earlier stated indicator at the bottom right of the screen, must be defeated in order for the lava pit to be lowered via planet tremor, thus allowing you instant access to the next area. Rinse, lather, repeat. Compared to the previous game, except in the Japanese version, as mentioned earlier, and in true Zelda, Star Tropics, Dragon Warrior, every damn Mario game starting with Super Mario World, every Final Fantasy game, not to mention every damn Kirby game starting with Kirby's Adventure, and especially Pokemon fashion, you're allowed a battery backup save feature where you can continue your journeys at a later time. And take note, depending on your cartridge battery's lifespan, it can really go to waste, resulting in your progress to be reset to fuck all, in which case you're left with no other goddamn alternative but to restart or replace your battery and or game copy. Speaking of which, upon death, you're taken back to the title following a Game Over declaration unlike the previous game. The most common gripes amongst many concerning this particular Black Sheep sequel of an outing, Zelda 2, Castlevania 2, and Snake's Revenge Syndrome much? Or that the exploration factor is limited and out of proportion, and that there's only so goddamn much that Samus can do in a singular specific area of SR388, mostly due to both the lava pit restrictions and the portable system's memory limitations. Despite the usual spot-on, if sometimes stagnant, controls, and the far from dull trademark gameplay aspect, while some view it as an advantage, others might view it as a detriment, mostly in terms of the exploration and gameplay experience. In my case, however, I'm definitely feeling both sides, if predominantly the former. With these new additions comes negative aspects of the gameplay. Like the first game, there's no map, which makes navigating the planet nearly impossible, as many pathways and corridors look similar. This comes as no surprise, given the limited capabilities of the Game Boy at the time. A map would have been achievable in this game, but since the aspect ratio of the Game Boy screen was small, it wasn't to be implemented. There isn't even an indicator except for hatched eggs to let you know if you're close by to a new Metroid, which results to you searching each area blindly, many of which will end up as rooms you've already traversed. This was a huge problem in the first game, but with the limited screen, it seems to strengthen the issue. Another is the lack of mini-boss variety, excluding the final, which will yet again be touched upon momentarily due to the repetitive nature of every confrontation. However, you'd be fucked beyond thoughts and words if you didn't have enough missiles. Lastly are the beam weapon swapping tactics whenever you explore later terrains. You know you're stuck with one just like the last game, no matter which one you obtain. And even the lack of music, despite having a few tunes thrown in, which are all around kick ass in my book, to compensate for the dark ambient tones of the SR388 cave areas, the latter of which will be further elaborated upon later. Return of Samus' challenge is where those earlier stated gripes come in, and here's one I'd also like to throw out there. No matter how long or how far you've traveled within a certain area, and despite having exterminated every Metroid throughout, chances are there's one that's still lurking around, which is why the Quake doesn't seem to take effect until after you've obliterated that very last Metroid within the area. Must I mention that farming and grinding your ass off for your key resources, namely energy and missiles, can be a repetitive beyond description task that's as gradual as a slug traversing from one side of a BMW to the other, and that the multiple endings depend on your duration? Other than the four main Metroid breeds to exterminate, which offer a range from very little to rather substantial degrees of challenge, reaching the final area is a whole fucking different story. After obliterating the only four Omega Metroids, not to mention including the last three, there are three upward shafts through which you can ascend and maneuver, the latter two of which contain both your Ice Beam Chozo statue, in case you weren't equipped with said beam before and or by this point, and both your energy refill and missile battery stations, respectively. 
Upon entering through the far left upward shaft, not only will you discover a mysteriously placed egg, your Metroid hunting counter will be spiked from 1 to 9 within the blink of an eye. Hence the return of, yep, you guessed them again, those menacing yet pathetic as fuck original Metroid hatchlings from the previous installment. Therefore, the same attack strategy applies here. Rinse, lather, and repeat until the appearance of none other than the notorious Queen Metroid. Although many tend to ignore it via the bottom crawl space on the off chance to refill Samus' resources, my god is she a pushover compared to Mother Brain, or hell, every other goddamn Metroid breed face throughout. Seriously, she makes Bacterion from Gradius look like Rushafil from Gargoyle's Quest. All she ever does is lunge and not twice, and then slide back and unleash her spiked loogie flame globs, through which you're able to perform your screw attack, and lather, rinse, and repeat. Take note, you need at least 150 missiles to exterminate that ravenous bitch once and for all. Not to mention, you can actually morph and spider ball your way right into her suck hole, down through her gut, land some bombs, and eventually roll your way out upon detonation, at the cost of a shit ton of energy no less, provided you've still got enough tanks under your belt. As always, should you manage to take your gruesome ass out Final Fantasy style, you can then make your way to the same egg you passed under before, minus the time bomb of course, and from within, hatches a baby Metroid larva that mistakes Samus as its one and only surrogate parent. Nothing personal, but but, well, considering you've heard this from every other reviewer out there. If the first thing I saw upon my birth was a spacesuit laden human, regardless of gender, I'd die quickly from instant shock alone. That aside, as you and said creature make your escape from those dreaded caverns, with the ladder consuming every foreign substance in your way, and back onto your gunship, the credits start rolling, complete with a front view animation of Samus sprinting towards you, and for the sake of yet again keeping the ending on the hush hush, please refer back to my last cluster of statements. While the graphics in this game outdoes its predecessor by twice the length of a whale's boner, most of the interior elements have undergone a well-deserved refurbishment in terms of the differentiating cavern areas, despite how redundant and dull they appear to be, even for Game Boy standards. Same story with old Samus herself, especially when she converts to her various suits. In fact, the provided color palette scheme on the Super Game Boy makes both her and the game's surroundings more definitive, despite how unfitting it might appear at first. Another noticeable sidestep is the frame rate isn't quite solid compared to the first game as your momentum at times feels sluggish, and this isn't only with running as rolling and jumping goes at a strobe pacing. While the signature mutant creatures are too much to delineate upon, the vast population of the four Metroid breeds, namely the aforementioned Alpha, Gamma, Zeta, and Omega, not to mention the extra adversaries featured, range from flat out inadequate, albeit menacing, to all out intense and ruthless, putting to shame even the Klingons and the Mogwai gremlins combined. Composed by Ryoji Yoshitomi. <clears throat> Kinda hate to cut you off there, RS, but that would be Ryoji Yoshitomi. While there's a few memorable tracks, there's others that leave much more than necessary to be desired. At least Samus's footsteps are toned down here as opposed to the previous installment, and don't clash too much with the music, unlike the other participating sound effects, which as ever tend to lose their charm after a while. Like with the original, Metroid 2 has much replay value, portable or stationed. However, many will be turned off by the colorless appearance and the sluggish frame rate of the gameplay, wishing that it was in color. While there have been a few attempts to color the game, none of which were accurately successful. Even with its flaws, Return of Samus on the Game Boy is an enjoyable game that follows the same strategic formula of its predecessor and greatly improves on it. Spoken like a true prodigy, Riley Sky. And notwithstanding its often raved about Black Sheep notoriety, it's due in part to the earlier discussed myriad of key fundamentals and approaches, or shit, if you're either a hardcore time consuming exploration junkie, or just flat out getting accustomed to its mechanics, consider yourself off your goddamn hinges to even think about turning this game the fuck down. <laughs> Final Exhibit, Super Metroid, released for the Super NES three years later. Shit it fruffly. As expected, the rudimentary structure continues right where its precursor, namely Return of Samus, left off. The game opens with not only this introductory narrative. The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. Yeah, thanks a lot, generic narrator. 
but also our main heroine paraphrasing all the shit she's been through regarding her previous two encounters. Except following the latter, she's taken it upon herself to deliver the diminutive larva to Sarah's space colony's own GRS, or Galactic Research Station in Fall, where the most intelligent researchers and scientists held a firm belief of the power it holds within, and their intent to fully utilize it. However, following Aaron's departure from the aforementioned super facility, she then receives a distress signal regarding its current outbreak. And you'll never guess who's behind all this horseshit. Superseding the same customary gameplay procedure from its two former outings, there's hints of continuity that take place upon reaching that very same baby Metroid larva sample, starting with an unexpected confrontation with a more impending yet familiar creature making its return from the first Metroid. Namely, isn't it obvious? Fucking Ridley! <laughs> After a brief, attempted survival and endurance test, he then flies off with a sample. Thus, in the true fashion of the first Metroid game, an emergency signal is triggered, and Sarah's eventually deteriorates itself to shit all, in which case, yep, you guessed it, an inevitable as fuck escape tactic takes place. Following said sequence, Samus then makes her way back to the ever so habitual planet Zebus via her signature gunship, which has undergone a dramatic transformation from her first ever mission there. Upon entering its interior cavern areas, the trademark non linear exploration, backtracking, and item procurement routines make their well deserved resurgence, complete with more new open world areas. In terms of Samus's much improved abilities, she can now fire in all eight directions unlike the first two, via the L and R buttons in terms of her diagonal aiming, and can sprint further and faster while holding down your preferred button, B by default, especially in conjunction with an all-new item yet to be discussed. Sonic, Flash, Mrs. Megawatt, move the fuck over. Hell, she can even wall jump in the style of Joe Musashi, Ryu Hayabusa, Mega Man X, and Batman, with the most precise timing and placement no less and perform a moonwalk in the style of God forbid the late MJ. And my god, it's at least a better effort than Kevin in the horrendous Home Alone game for the NES by THQ and Bethesda. As before, Samus can not only acquire her signature enhancements, with new ones thrown into the mix, starting with the usual Morph Ball along with its participating bomb, which now has a new feature. Aside from morphing on ground, it can also be performed in mid-air. Her usual energy tanks and missile expansions, high jump boots, Varia and gravity suits, the latter of which is not only an in-game exclusive, it's also feasible for improved mobility through liquid areas, and even immunity against lava. So you've got your space jump, spring ball, screw attack, and even the all-new grappling beam for swinging through via magnetic blocks and even enemies. The X-ray scope for detecting hidden passageways and destroyable blocks. And remember the item I was talking about? The old speed booster for much improved speed. So refer back to the dashing ability. I was gonna forget about the weapons? Think the fuck again. In addition to the all-new charge beam, which can also be activated while jumping, in a true R-Type and Mega Man 4 through 8 fashion, you can actually fire off more powerful renditions of all your beams, hence its name. The ice beam's back, not to mention the spacer, the plasma beam, and adding to the lineup is your super missiles, which are five times as powerful as your original missiles. And you've got your power bombs, which fuck no has jack shit to do with wrestling. Make no goddamn mistake, it's way more powerful than the normal morph ball bombs. Contra 3 much? And even the end-all, be-all coup de gras of laser. No spoiler intended, ladies and gents. The fucking Hyper Beam, acquired at the very end. She can also access a map by pausing at any time, and can even access undiscovered areas at various intervals, unlike the previous two Metroid games, despite having to discover every nook and cranny on her own. It can even swap out and fuse her weapons whenever possible. With the traditional mutant enemies also making their comeback, the menacing space pirates, much unlike the ones you faced before, are pretty much the highlight of this installment. And man, what total pushovers they are! But as you progress, they eventually become more volatile, especially those with martial arts techniques that put even the likes of the Kosuki family, and even Van Damme himself to complete shame. And the less I say about those ravenous insect-like key hunters, the better. Let's just say they are more than capable of retorting with their acid and even their sides. In terms of the open world areas, aside from Samus's landing on Zebus's introductory surface area, Crataria, and even more familiar recurring areas including Brinstar, Norfair, and even an abandoned and more foobar up the ass Torian from the first game, yes, the same place where she kicked Mother Brain's ass. We see her exploring the wrecked ship, narrow and space yet still detrimental, and even the submerged and vast beyond imagination Meridia, containing the watered down and preposterously defenseless failed Metroid clones known as Mock Droids. Seriously, they make even the space pirates themselves look like the Red Falcon soldiers from Contra and Metal Command from Shatterhand combined. Featured within these areas are not only the familiar space pirate dickweeds returning from the first game, especially the aforementioned Ridley, and even a much improved and oversized rendition of See? What did I tell ya? Fucking Kraid. But also the appearances of newer and more resilient adversaries. 
including the bomb Torizo, starting out as a Chozo statue, and then resurrects itself as a more impending version, with a later and more volatile Golden Twin following far behind. And then we have, ladies and gents, another goddamn RG2 wannabe, the Spore Spawn, that fires off spores, hence its name, and is only vulnerable through its suck hole when open, discovered it in the even deeper underground areas of Brinstar. Moai from Gradius much? Crocomire, a massive red 8-eyed beast found within Norfair. Platoon, otherwise known as what I like to call the bastard child of Leatherhead and Ekans, or better yet, a hybrid of a crocodile and a serpent, discovered in Meridia. Fantoon, a cycloptic flying apparition of a cephalopod, discovered in the wrecked ship. And even Dragon, a colossalous boss, Cretaceous son of a bitch known as an Avere, also seen in Meridia. But none of these extraterrestrial cockknockers so much as compare to what's in store for our valiant Samus at the very end. Bottom line, even as she approaches each and every aforestated target, you really have to maintain a perceptive, dauntless mindset in terms of keeping track of your current location via the map, not to mention your usual obstacle maneuvering tactics, and even the shoot first, ask questions later routines. Cause paraphrasing Showdown Little Tokyo, they'll do a hell of a lot more than disintegrate your ass into heavy metal sushi, thus, as always, leading us headlong into our next field of reference. Must I yet again declare how fluid and PC mouse responsive the controls are, with little to no setbacks whatsoever, complete with its commonplace yet rigorously augmented beyond expectations gameplay aspect? In full concern of Super Metroid's challenge, feel free to refer back to what I discussed in my previous statement concerning every key strategy. As ever, there's no way in fuck I'm reiterating it all. Oh no. Besides, notwithstanding all the extra improvements in terms of the all-new abilities and benefits you're A, provided with from the get-go, and or B, on the hunt for at every turn, it's still up to you to pinpoint each hidden area and fulfill every integral, pivotal goal that lies ahead. And bear in mind the following. The same battery backup function applies from its Game Boy predecessor, which is available at various locations, including Samus' gunship at the beginning this time around. Same story with the usual contrasting endings depending on not only your duration of completing the game, but also the overall percentage of every item acquired throughout. Hell, even with a guide, whether it's via Nintendo Power or on the web, the game's experience is instantly tarnished, if not fully, due to the loss of the true sense of exploration. With the obvious exception of the familiar areas from its NES predecessor, the chances of getting lost are slightly higher here by comparison, well, predominantly by reason of the new submerged Meridia. After you obtain the Speed Booster, the Shine Spark ability is a huge must if you're willing to progress any further aside from every other ability discussed so far. Anyways, while activating the former, both on ground and even in mid-air, you have to instantly and precisely map out the trajectory of your leap in one of five possible directions, as tutored by the ostrich-like Takora. Should the effect happen to wear off, you've gotta activate that shit from the get-go. And unlike the last two, upon death, you're given a choice to either continue or end, the latter of which directs you back to the save and load menu. Repetitive as the graphics might appear to be at times, the overall visual presentation is massive in the most absolute, tremendous deal of detail imaginable. Hell, it even trumps the bejesus out of even its two predecessors. All of the familiar areas from the first NES outing have been flat out beyond belief drastically revamped to perfection with its trademark tense and dark atmospheres, and none of that gimmicky ass copy and paste palette swap bullshit, and the same goes with Samus herself in terms of her signature actions, not to mention the appropriate weapon she utilizes, and even the advanced aerobic overhaul she's been provided with. And for the absolute last time, let's not get ourselves started with the bread and butter enemies and bosses. Like most Super NES games during its heyday, the modes of an effects and even the layering and transparency features don't disappoint even a smidgen, some examples including Norfair and Meridia. As far as music and sound is concerned, composed by the combined efforts of Kenji Yamamoto and Minako Hamano, the former of Punch-Out fame alongside Yukio Kaneoka and Akito Nakatsuka, and the latter of Zelda Link's Awakening fame, as well as later Metroid games, including Prime 2 and 3, Fusion, Zero Mission, and the like, and even Super Smash Bros. Brawl, the soundtrack has also been provided a well-deserved revamp in terms of much more than the trademark uncanny Supernatural theme that it interprets to a T, fitting every atmospheric vicinity throughout. There's even more elements in every tune, ranging from subtlety, isolation, on Wii and ambiance. To more driving Cloud9 and intensified mood types. The standard 16 bit fair sound effects are nothing short of tolerable and appropriate for each situation, and have been once again given a much deserved facelift, just like every other element touched upon thus far. Concerning Super Metroid's replayability, as ever, need I express any further how this appropriate outing has been gaining an endlessly vast cult following since its first ever release, let alone its lasting value? Refer back to what me and O'Reilly Sky examined regarding the previous two Metroid games in terms of their redeeming factors and learning curves. 
In true Super Godzilla fashion, sure it's not for everyone, but it flat out merits the acclaim and appreciation that it's been amassing for years and years and years due to every key element I've discussed. Shit, it even goes without saying that this was marked at number 1 in ScrewAttack.com's two-part Top 20 Super NES Games countdown, and that Juan Ortiz, aka some call me Johnny, and David White from Super Gaming Brothers and GameSack respectively, cover to this very day. Bottom line, if you like them both, if only the former, Super Metroid will make your ass keep coming back every fucking time like no other. Therefore, I consider my life worth absolute fuck all without this game. In rigorous summation, my final verdict on the Metroid franchise, it's easy to see why it's come a long way in terms of its distinctive qualities that make it stand out amongst all the rest. And on the usual scale of 1 to 10, here's how I rate all three games. Despite the median penultimate's flaws and negatives that most tend to recognize, and even how less than appealing it was by comparison, all are definitely worthy of not only her legacy alone, but those of other female protagonists, even the ones I threw out earlier, that have come and went throughout the years. And must I mention that I'm dedicating this 3-tier review to all feminists out there? Whether you're new to Metroid, a huge big-time experienced ace like yours truly, or just flat-out familiarizing yourself with it, I strongly suggest getting the hell out there and tracking them down a fucking sap. They're even available via the classic NES series on Game Boy Advance, in the case of the former, and even on the Wii, Wii U, and 3DS Virtual Consoles. You have my full utmost assurance that there won't be so much as a trace of regret concerning this ever-so-sought-after, envied, and esteemed franchise. There is a full-fledged remake on the way titled AM2R, an acronym for another Metroid 2 remake, which is being developed by a programmer under the name Dr. M64. Unlike several small attempts, this one is a much larger scale. It's a painstaking reimagining of Return of Samus in a similar style to Metroid Zero Mission that has been in development since 2008, and from recent updates, the game is nearly complete. For Metroid fans, this is a must-have. The newest demo is available to play, and the developer is always open to feedback to make the experience better. As always, before I go, I'd like to take this opportunity and thank Riley Sky 100 for yet another unforgettable collaboration. I'm Riley Sky. Until next time, see you all later. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Hardcore Retro God officially signing off. Also, thumbs up for mock balls.